Thank you so much. That's actually my favorite Irish blessing. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker here, one of the newest master beekeepers for the state of West Virginia, and one of our very own, Deb Martin. Did everyone get a handout that I had printed off and you signed in? I'm shocking. Okay. Okay, so I'm Debbie. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Debbie Martin, and I've been a beekeeper for 14 years. This is my 13th year being a member of the club. So this is home for me. I, I love everybody here. I'm friends with everybody here, and I like seeing all the new people coming as well. So thanks for that. We always like to see new beekeepers. Um, I did this presentation at the fall conference last year uh, as part of the master beekeeping program. So um, uh, Steve Roth told me that it was a very nice program and it was informative and he enjoyed it. So I thought this is a perfect time of year that we should go over it so that we know what we're looking for, that our bees will be looking for, for nectar. Okay, here's the basic anatomy. The um, proboscis comes down from the bee's mouth, and the gloss is his tongue, and that's where it sticks down into the flowers to get the nectar. So that's um, when they take the nectar in, they, um, I don't think I can eat anything tonight. Uh, they carry the nectar from their honey, they put it in their honey crop. It's different. I don't have food. It's different from their stomach, because you can see the bee's stomach, but the honey crop is a different place. They'll fly 55,000 miles and visit 2 million flowers. I don't know why I'm going to do that. Me neither. That work. Is it going to be Okay. Okay. Um, just to produce one pound of honey. So they used to say that if you were making you know, toast or something, put honey on it, lick the knife because every drop is precious. Um, this is a, a flower, the anatomy of a flower, and in here it is your ovule. And that's where the um, eggs are, like the, I guess you call them eggs. The bees, when they come into the flower, they will get on the, um, the oh shoot, what are those called? And yeah, it's the anders, thank you. <laughs> and then um, the pollen and stuff gets on the ovules, and then it fertilizes a plant, and you get um, seeds. Will this change with this too? Yes, I'm not there. <laughs> okay. Dandelions. Give me just one time. What I do? You do, go. I didn't put it in, so I'm not going to do that. Oh, it did. Oh. Now I go left and right. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Dandelions. Everybody doesn't like dandelions. Everybody puts stuff on their lawn to keep the dandelions from blooming, and it's just sad. Dandelions are one of the very first uh, sources of food for honeybees in the spring. And at my house, we don't spray them, we don't do anything, and I even let it grow um, higher than the neighbors all the time, just so there's more of them available for my bees. Okay, it's not moving. I'm pushing, it's not going anywhere. This is new. I haven't used it very much yet, I'm sorry. That worked. No, no. Yeah, that's my last one. Okay, autumn olive. Autumn olive is an invasive species. Um, there's a lot of it around. If you travel I 79 up around the um, Middletown Mall exit, both sides of the hill and the roads are just covered with autumn olive. It's little red berries on it. Bees just absolutely love it. And um, you can get autumn olive honey as a specialty honey. Uh, some people sell. Um, 
It's very prolific in West Virginia. We have a lot of it uh, close to my house as well. Apples. I have some apple trees in my house, and I'm telling you, we had apple trees for many years, and with very little um, bees around, we'd see a honeybee maybe once a summer, and we never got any apples, and we got honeybees, and now our apple trees are just full every year, and we have to give tons of apples away because they do such a good job. Um, they uh, also produce nectar and pollen, so the bees get a little bit of both from those. Black locust. Again, black locust is another one of those plants that's um, uh, marketed exclusively. You can buy black locust honey, and it's usually really good. It's got a really uh, nice, delicate taste to it. It blooms early to mid-May, and it is a major source of nectar. Bees. Now, red bud is um, it, it's a wild tree. Some people do uh, grow them in their yard ornamentally, but uh, usually you see a lot of it blooming along the interstates as well. Um, it's a minor pollen source, uh, and it's orange in color. It's, got, it's a pink per, or pinkish purple flower, but the pollen from it's orange. But it's definitely a major nectar source for the bees as well. Tulip poplar. Okay, poplar trees here are everywhere. And um, they produce uh, a creamy colored pollen and a lot of nectar. The pollen or the uh, poplar bloom, when it opens, opens like this. And you'll hear people say that if it rains, it washes the nectar out. And that it does, it, it, it not washes the uh, nectar out, so it takes up to three days after it quits raining for the poplar to make more nectar for the bees. So that's why it's kind of hard to get to a poplar honey sometimes because the rain is really hard on it. And it seems like when we have a good uh, spring and the poplar's blooming really well, we always end up having a really bad storm and it breaks a bunch of the branches out and it seems like it's hit and miss. Um, and it also uh, is a good source of pollen and nectar for the bees. Basswood, now this is something that we don't have. I don't have, I live on Bunner's Ridge in Fairmont. It's way up on top of the hill. I think it's like the highest point in Marion County. And uh, we don't have basswood up there, but we do have sourwood, which is another one. And they're in the same family. Um, we had a, um, member Mark Vasilla uh, several years ago ordered a bunch of trees and uh, we planted them and we bought little leaf linden trees and this just a basswood is what it is so we planted those and Mark mine one of them has bloomed once or twice but I, well it'd be nice it would be nice yeah um, I, I can't believe I've not seen any more bloom on them than I have because they, they look nice or shape nice, but they just haven't, haven't really had a good uh, flower on them yet. Um, it's both a major pollen and nectar source for bees. It has a light yellow um, to orange uh, pollen and it blooms from uh, late July to early August. Now this is sourwood, and I have a lot of sourwood at my house. In fact, it's right above my bees' boxes. So in the when the sourwoods bloom, and it's just straight up for them, you can watch them just going up and down uh, constantly. They love the sourwood. Now the best thing about the sourwood is is that the blooms on them hang down, so the rain does not wash the nectar out of the sourwood. Sourwood honey is very good honey. I mean I've we prefer it to other kinds. It's really clear. It's almost white. I mean, like like watercolor. It's it's um, very delicate taste of a flower. You get a little floral taste to it. Um, it does have um, uh, uh, pollen and honey, or pollen and nectar for the bees. And it's one of your last trees that's going to bloom before the dearth in the summer. So usually once the sourwood gets done, that's when I start pulling my supers and start spinning uh, and extracting. That way I, I know that I get the sourwood in my honey when, I, when it's done. <clears throat> 
Joe pot weed is um, it's a plant that grows along the roads. You see it a lot, uh, like in farm areas and stuff. It's a purple flower, and it blooms in late July uh, to mid-August. Um, it's sometimes you'll see places where there's a lot of them, but most of the time it's not quite so uh, prolific. But the bees do like it, and they will use it. Everybody's favorite goldenrod. If you, everybody here who has bees knows what goldenrod is, but if you have not had bees yet or you're just getting started, goldenrod is something that will probably run you in the opposite direction rather than to the bee yard. We have a breezeway between my house and my garage, and when the wind's blowing past the bees up toward the house, it's, we always said it smelled like somebody took their gym bag full of wet, <laughs> stinky clothes and left it in a car in July for two weeks and didn't take it out. That's how bad it smells. The pollen is really yellow and your entrance boards will turn yellow because of all the pollen that they carry in from the goldenrod. Goldenrod has a really strong taste to it too. If you if you uh, have golden or yeah, goldenrod pollen, honey coming in, taste it because it's it's kind of strong. That's why I take my supers off before goldenrod comes in because I don't want that taste in my honey. I will, uh, if I take a fall um, crop and it's got goldenrod in it, it's fine. I, I'll sell it if people want it, but I usually just leave it for the bees for winter. Um, the next one is sumac. And sumac, you see those a lot on the interstate. There's a couple different kinds, and I'm not sure if there's a difference in which ones um, do which, or, or I mean, which ones bees go to, there's one more than the other. Some of them, the, the bloom is more upright, and sometimes some of them branch off and, and they have more than one seed head on top. But it's a major source of pollen and nectar for honeybees. Another thing with the sumac, if you can find the sumac trees when they die in the fall, <clears throat> those seed head pods, you can break those off and dry them. They work really good in smokers. So you can use it as smoker fuel. Just put it up somewhere, keep it dry, and then you can use it the next year to use for your smoker. <clears throat> chestnut trees, I know there's not a lot of chestnut trees out there, but if you have one, uh, your bees will be in it. They really like chestnut. They go to it a lot. I know my brother had bees and he had a chestnut tree in his yard and all you could hear was bees. It just, the whole tree hummed when it was in bloom. Um, it blooms um, late July, early August and the honeybees just love it. And I, I don't know, I think there's a thing uh, I saw somewhere online that uh, there are places uh, that actually want you to uh, buy or maybe give you chestnut trees to grow just because they are good for pollinators. And since chestnut were wiped out years and years ago, you know, they want to start bringing them back. Blackberry and raspberry plants, the wild ones, uh, they both bloom about the same time. Bees like both of them. Um, <clears throat> they produce a small amount of pollen, but major nectar. So it's good for them. And then the berries are good for me because I love raspberries and blackberries. Now here's another thing, the white Dutch clover. Um, most people have it in their lawn. Uh, it just it's grows it, everywhere it touches on the ground. It just shoots off and keeps going. Um, it's very good for the bees. They really like it in the summer, usually in July is, and August is when it blooms. So the, um, the bees go to it because there's really nothing else blooming. And this is what we call the dearth. And this is when your bees will be a lot more aggressive and they won't, uh, uh, they don't want you in the boxes. Uh, you'll have a hard time with them. A lot of times we will, again, we will not mow every week or every other week. We, we give them a few weeks in between. That way there's more of it there uh, for them to make it available for them. It does produce a, a major nectar source for them as well. <laughs> Milkweed. When I moved to where I'm at now, there was a lot of milkweed up there. 
We used to, my son was little and he would get the monarch um, caterpillars off of them. And he would bring them home and he would put them in a, a little bug box. And every day he would go out to the road and he'd pick a couple leaves off of a milkweed plant and bring them home and put them in the box to feed the worms. And then when they make their chrysalis and hang, then they'd hatch out. And when they did, he loved just turning them loose and watching them go. He enjoyed that so much. He did it a lot. He would do it with cabbage worms off of cabbage in our garden and turn the little white butterflies loose. And then I was up there, you know, trying to get them out of my cabbage again. Um, milkweed blooms late June, mid-July. Um, it's an excellent plant for pollinators and uh, definitely for monarch butterflies. Like I said, we, we don't even see milkweed at our house anymore and haven't seen a, I haven't seen a monarch butterfly in years. Japanese knotweed. Now this is something that is very invasive. Um, it came here in the 1800s. Uh, a friend of mine told me there was a woman that had a couple vines and she literally cut sections like three inches long and she walked up along a creek bank. She just dropped one, snipped one off, dropped one. She just kept walking and it just took over the whole creek and um, bees love it. They just absolutely love it. It's a really dark honey. So it kind of looks like um, your buckwheat honey, like it's a used motor oil is what it looks like. Um some people really like it, some people don't. It's just a preference. Um, oh, yeah. It's one of the ones that's um, antibacterial and antimicrobial. Uh, it's an antioxidant and it's uh, cardio protective. So there's a lot of good benefits to the knotweed. Um, and the, uh, of course that helps the honey when you have bug feces in it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> wing stem. Uh, these are also, you kind of see them in pastures and along the roads and stuff. It is a member of the aster family. <clears throat> it gets a yellow bloom on it, and the center of it has little spiky little green uh, pieces that come up off of it. Uh, the petals have no function other than to attract pollinators, but um, so they don't produce, you know, big fancy flowers, just a few. Uh, yellow petals to make it attractive to the bees. <clears throat> oh, and that was the end. That was all that I had. Now, there's a couple other things that bloom um, that the bees uh, like um, that other people, you know, some people will see and some won't. Um, like I said, I don't get fast with where I live at, so my bees don't usually do that, but um, there's lots of goldenrod where I live, so we never usually have to feed in the winter. But they, they bring plenty of goldenrod in, that's not a problem. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I know there's a couple other things that they eat, or they, they uh, use, but uh, a lot of people will buy plants, because they'll, they'll tell you there are certain plants that you can buy. Salvia uh, is one. Um, there's a different kind of a, a, a butterfly bush, yeah, butterfly bushes and stuff like that that you can buy. And my son and I would travel to different greenhouses and stuff. And if we saw honeybees on the flowers in the greenhouses, we would buy one because we thought, oh yeah, that's good for the bees. And then we'd bring them home and the only thing we'd ever see on them is bumblebees. Honeybees are very smart and they're not gonna to come to your garden for one little plant when they can go right here to a maple tree that's got millions of blooms in it. So you can put whatever you want in your yard and it's fine because it, it does help the natural pollinators, but it really doesn't do much for the bees. You'll see a few on it once in a while, but usually they go for the trees. That's their big source for food. And that's why they hit those really hard in the spring when they're all blooming, so. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I have rhododendron in my yard, and they love it. And then I, oh yeah, they're on it. Really? Now is it a real like rhododendron bush, or is it like the old mountain laurel that they call rhododendron? Yeah, it's probably mountain laurel. I mean, it's our we have our yard is pretty woody, but um, so I read 
that rhododendron, I read somebody was saying that rhododendron, when they, they take it and use it, it makes them um, angry. No, I've never heard that. But I've, I've always heard where it gets needed or where they, they use it for that kind of stuff. It's, um, I've heard that, you know, I've heard that they don't like it at all. In fact, that I've heard that it's actually toxic to me. Well, that's what I was just going to say. I don't know if they make a toxic honey. Yeah. I've read that too, and I eat my honey and it don't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they really like it. Well, there's a tree that grows by me. There's only I've, I've only seen two in my life, and this it's called a devil's walking stick, and it grows near my house. And they say that bees will take it, but they say it leaves a horrible taste. It's a not a, I mean, it's not for, you can't eat it. It's so bad. So I don't imagine that my bees have found it because it's just one little tree, and it you know it blooms really well, and it blooms really late too. It's probably I'd say August into September when it blooms, but um, it's, they'll go to it, but like I said, they say the honey from it is absolutely terrible. Oh. Yeah, I'm surprised that they go to your rhododendron because we have mountain laurel and my neighbors have rhododendrons and we don't see them on them at all. Really? Yeah. yeah. Like my neighbors right across from me bought two little flowering crab apple trees and they don't produce crab apples or anything because they're just for show for the flowers and when I got the honeybees they started making fruit and they actually I mean they're not they won't grow but they just put puts out little cherries and they get mad now because they just they have to rake up wagons full of cherries out of their yard now where they never used to because like I said when we didn't have bees we would never see a honeybee so when we got ours it kind of really helped and if you put a garden out you would, you will, be, they'll go after beans. They love cucumbers. They do not pollinate tomato plants though. I've never seen them to be on a tomato plant. But I'll see three or four of them in the squash and the zucchini, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they love gardens. You, you, your garden will do a lot better if you have plenty of bees around, so. They love signposts. Oh, yes. Everybody should plant stuff. Yes, they do go crazy over sunflowers. And they'll go after corn when it tossles. I've seen them in my garden do it, but usually it's real early in the morning they go to it. If you go through the day, they're not they're not into it. But if you go up in the evening or, or the morning real early, like when the sun's coming up, they'll be all over it. And my neighbor has some kind of grass. It's not pompous grass, but it's something that gets like a big plume on it, like a, a pompous grass. And I've seen them on it before, just going crazy, getting pollen out of it. And I I don't know what it is or why they find it attractive, unless it's just because it is a pollen source. So they'll take it when they can get it. <clears throat> yeah, sedum is another plant that they like. And we have one, but again, you know, they don't ever go to it. We don't hardly ever see them on it. Uh, we had these one flowers uh, that we had along the sidewalk. Uh, it's called a blanket flower, and it kind of looks like, I would say like a daisy, because it's got petals on it like a daisy, but the center of it's kind of fuzzy, and the honeybees like it real well, and uh, we've had bumblebees. They'll get in it, and literally, they'll sleep on them all night. You, you get up the next morning, you'll see three or four of them huddled in there together, but they just kind of hang out on them, so... We, uh, we, like I said, we bought lots of stuff over the years uh, to feed, you know, to help feed the bees, but they usually don't come to that kind of stuff. So that's why we kind of encourage people to do trees, buy trees that, uh, you know, that they like, um, ornamental stuff. Pussy willow. Somebody was uh, telling me that pussy willow was blooming and the bees were all over it. That's a really good tree. They like it a lot too. Do you find your box lives? Um, get much attention? I don't have boxwood and I've not seen it, but I've heard they like privet hedge. I have I have two boxwoods that are like right beside my house and they were there before we got bees, but after we got the bees, the, the bushes themselves buzz in the spring. Mm -hmm. like they're so full of bees that they just like almost shake. They like take over the whole thing. Holly is like that too. That's another tree. Yeah, holly tree is like that as well. Yeah. I used to walk and there was a huge holly tree and I would walk under it and I heard bees going crazy and I 
I thought, is there a swarm? And I just looked up and there was just, it was nothing but bees, all kinds of bees up in that tree. So they really like holly as well. We have a huge holly tree. And I just encourage everybody in my neighborhood to grow stuff, grow all these stuff because they don't like anything except that I wrote it in my front yard. Well, you see, you're right there in town too, and that makes it kind of hard for you. I don't even, I tried one year, I tried to put all these flowers out. I never saw it beyond. Do you ever see them on your pine trees when they're blooming? No. Down the street. I see them in my neighborhood, like all the way at the end of the streets and stuff, but never in my area. We had pine trees, and you know they get a lot of pollen on them. I mean a lot of pollen when they're blooming. And I've never seen them on it, and I just didn't know if anybody else noticed pollen or bees from, uh, you know, taking pollen from a pine tree. It's odd, you'd think they would at least try it, but you know, they know, I mean, they know what they want. They get it every year and they know what tastes like what and what they like. So they go after it. But definitely if you want something to grow or produce, uh, you know, something for you like vegetables, you can't go wrong with a, just one hive of bees, you know, it would, it would increase your yield exponentially, so. You said that it's better to have trees rather than the plant flowers because we're just going to decrease our garden and have part of the garden and the other half flowers. Is that not be a It had it probably wouldn't. I mean it's not gonna be a noticeable difference. Like I said, you might see a few in there and it depends on what it is. I bought salvia which is, um, you can get it in different kinds. Um, it's just a tall, spiky flower. And blues and purples are pretty much your better flowers for honeybees. They like those colors. They don't see red. They see red as black. Um, yellow isn't on the spectrum of what they see, but like the blues and the purples, that those are kind of the colors that they like. So I try to stick with things with that color. So I've got, I've got uh, two or three blue salvia um, I buy blue delphinium, and they go after those a little bit, but um, I've heard there's a guy in Whitehall, Debbie, do you know maybe, um, that has a lavender farm. Yes, yes, and lavender is a thing that they like, uh, all kinds of herbs, actually, because herbs have tiny little flowers on them, so honeybees like things with tiny little flowers on them, so they go to those as well. Um, so any kind of herbs you grow uh, will attract them, but you know, you know, like I said, the plants aren't going to be overrun. You'll get a few in there, but it won't be, you know, a bunch. But um, lavender, they used to have a program where you could, they would, you know, give you lavender, but you'd have to plant like two or three acres of it just to get that, them to actually go to it. Again, like I said, they go for whatever is, um, um, a bigger source that they can get and get it easier than, you know, spreading out and trying to pick here and there. Yes, so sir. We have been bees our first year, <clears throat> but a couple questions. Every time it was warm this winter, they were crazy busy coming out of the house. Yes. What were they doing? Well, they'll go out and go on cleansing flights mostly so that they can get out, stretch their wings, use the bathroom. You know, obviously they don't do that in the box. Um, they try to keep the house clean, so they'll do that. And um, I know now this time of the year we have some brood. Everybody's uh, bees are building up. So brood's coming out, and they're doing a little bit of um, orientation flights and things. But, yeah, on warm days like now, they are definitely in and out on cleansing flights and looking for food. The other thing was they were more brood Yes. So the seed, the millet and the uh, sunflowers and uh, all the little uh, stuff that comes in your um, feed, even the cracked corn, has little bits of pollen in it where they um, where they process it. So they go to it. I've heard people say they put it in like, they found them in their chicken feed or in their horse food, stuff like that, because they can find a little bit of food in it. Plus sweet stuff, like if you have sweet feed that you feed your horses or something, you know, it's a little bit of sweet, and there's minerals in it, so they'll go to it for that as well. Maple's out, though, right? I mean, Maple's out right now. Yeah, the red. There's a red maple in front of my garage, and it's odd. 
all I could hear was bees yesterday. I was out there spray painting. And yeah, yeah, mine too. Hard frost tonight. Hard frost tonight? How bad? <laughs> Hard? I didn't know. I haven't heard that yet. I still have my coat, my covers on my knees. So. Yeah. I'm afraid to because I know that we're going to get a good storm, you guys. It's still March. March is one of those months where it's either really nice or it's really bad. Yeah. And you know, we didn't have a winter. We really didn't have a winter this year. There wasn't hardly any snow. There wasn't hardly any rain, really. It wasn't that bad. So. Yeah. When do I take those Whenever you start um, doing inspections and the weather warms up, you can probably take them off any time now. I'd wait maybe another couple of weeks, get to get to the end of March, and then I'd think about maybe starting to remove some of that stuff. Yeah. 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 I've never heard of it. That's odd. Sometimes they just like to tear stuff up, I think. Yeah, I mean, I put house wrap on my knees. They have, um, it comes in four by eight sheets. It's so easy, you just cut out the pieces and uh, we just put duct tape down the corners, wrap it around the box and it's a half inch insulation that helps keep them uh, warmer. Um, I put my entrance as small as I can and then I, um, of course, leave the hole open in the top so the air can go through. Um, I don't. I tip my boxes forward. That way, any condensation will run to the front, and um, I don't usually have any problems with moisture in my boxes. So, I mean, if you put quilt boxes on, that's fine. If if they work good, that's great. But um, if you, I would wait a couple more weeks and just make sure that we're out of this bad, bad weather. I mean, we could still have bad weather in April because my son, uh, his birthday is the 24th of April, and we got six inches of snow one year on his birthday. So I know that we still have a few more weeks, uh, maybe a month or so to go before things will be. I think I think we can take a breath and then take everything off. So, did you use your pollen feeder this year that we made last year? Yes. Did your bees go to it? Actually, no. I put pollen patty inside and they were favoring it, not the pollen feeder. Yeah, well, obviously it's in the box, so they're going to take it first. I put pollen out in my feeders and they didn't go to it hardly at all, and I was shocked. This year? Yeah, this year. Well, my bees had four or five frames of pollen going into winter last year. They kept pollen heavy last year. I've never had them keep that much pollen and I was sure we were going to have a really bad winter because they had a lot of honey and they had a lot of pollen and I said that just makes me think it's going to be a really bad winter and I was totally wrong. I was seeing pollen and bees. My goodness, must have been close to the end of November. Oh yeah. Yeah. I believe that. I had brood in December so they were starting to lay eggs in one box in December. So usually around the solstice, your days start getting longer and the bees know that. So then that's when they start working, trying to uh, get ready for a brood and start getting ready for pollen and stuff coming in. Yeah. Nectar. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it's here. It's gonna be a long year this year because you know, we didn't, didn't have hardly any winter, so we're already in them in February this year. And, you know, next, we've got all summer to go. Who knows how long it'll be before we're done. You know, we might get snow in October. We've had that happen before. Uh, we had 14 inches of snow in October probably eight years ago. And uh, so you just never know. Anybody else? Any questions about anything? If we got a minute, Mark Basilla. <laughs> yeah, I heard a couple people. <coughs> Keith blew over the other night, and there was somebody posted on Facebook. I don't know if it's this group, but one of theirs, uh, the lid blew off at Christmas when we had all that really cold weather. But I heard it's doing okay. So 
Steve, did you say yours blew over? No, because somebody got their razor hand. Dan the man? Yeah, I got this one. Lid blow off. They're fine. Okay. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you so much. I uh, brought some books in tonight. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not going to be teaching uh, classes anymore for the kids. Uh, not unless I'm asked, but I have a lot of kids books, so I'm donating them to the club so that uh, it's in our library and anybody can use them, sign them out. Uh, Pat, I know, borrowed some and takes them to her grandson's school and they get to read them to the kids and stuff. So if anybody wants to borrow them, there's a sign in and sign out sheet. So just uh, know that there's a handful of books here now for kids if anybody's interested to borrow. So. Well, thank you so much. And we'll add those. We started a uh, youth library at the end of last year, right after our spring conference. I guess the middle of last year, right after our spring conference. It's been a long year. My gosh. We started a kids library, so we do actually have a few other uh, youth books as well that we'll put these with for anybody who wants to um, utilize these resources when you're out educating the public. Every once in a while, you'll run upon that opportunity to go talk at a school or visit some family and, and uh, want to talk to some kids there, and all of these resources are really great for that. So thank you so much. All right, before we jump into the meeting, I'm going to give everybody a break, get some snacks, Make sure you sign up for bees. Um, I, I do want to mention a couple things specifically. Um, the snacks tonight were provided by uh, Pat and Chuck, so thank you so much for bringing snacks. They actually um, are all made with local honey, and there are recipe sheets there for you as well, um, which is a neat addition to our normal snack routine here. So please feel free to take some recipe sheets. Um, there's also some spotted lanternfly honey with an information sheet about that, um, and there is something else. Oh, yes, and Corin and, well, yes, and, and Victor brought on a bunch of snacks as well. Thank everyone for bringing the snacks this evening. Absolutely. We really appreciate you guys for keeping us fed here. Um, get some bees. There are three different suppliers that we have over here. Check out our, um, our bee suppliers. They're all nuke suppliers. They have their prices and everything listed there. We're going to be doing these orders through the club, and we'll uh, organize uh, pickup days and all of that for anyone that's interested. So check that stuff out um, in the time that we're going to have here. But uh, I'm going to give everyone just about five minutes. Go to the bathroom, get some snacks, and we'll get started with the rest of the meeting. Yeah, 
Yeah. All right, get the last of your snacks. We're going to get started here in just a minute. Eastwood Elementary. to um, help with this event. It really turned out to be a great event. We appreciate all of you that came out. And that being said, there are quite a few new members here today that were there um, at that class over the past two weeks. So if you are seeing people that you haven't met yet, say hi. Um, we want to make this as uh, inclusive as a group for everybody as possible. So make sure you're all friendly. I promise uh, they're friendly normally too at this. <laughs> All right, uh, another bit of old business is the uh, West Virginia Beekeepers Association Spring Conference is um, set to happen on March 17th and 18th. 
It'll be in Clarksburg down at the Village Square Conference Center um, in West or in Milford Street in Clarksburg. Yeah. Um, there, uh, registration is closed. There are no longer any spaces available, but if you are registered, you can go on their website and check out all of the vendors and all of the speakers and things like that that they're going to have offered there. Um, a lot of the, the vendors will be offering pre-orders, so you can check out those websites individually, get some stuff pre-ordered, that way you're prepared for beekeeping season. That is correct to my understanding as well. Yeah, I, I'm not, I, I don't know the logistics as, as to why, but I, I don't believe, I, I didn't see them on any of the lists that we got either. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think that Man Lake and Day Dan are out for this one. But um, that being said, they do have I think like 22 or 23 vendors that are going to be there, all beekeeping suppliers. So this will be a nice opportunity for some of us who have utilized Man Lake and Day Dan almost exclusively, but not necessarily wanted to over the years, to try some new things. Um, some of these companies get to be a little big, and then uh, they act a little big. So this will be be a, a nice opportunity to try some of the littler guys. Make sure you register your hives. That's not cut off the edge of the screen, I'm sorry, but it says register. Um, if you are coming out, um, this is an old business right now because you would be uh, keeping your registration up to date currently. You can go on the West Virginia Department of Agriculture's website to do that. So, um, and there's actually links to the registration portals directly on your uh, newsletter for this month as well. If you have any questions or you want to register by paper or update your registration by paper, let me know because I also have paper versions as well and I can send those in. Correct. Yes, because if for some reason a bear got into your hives right now and took them all out, if they looked at your registration, it would only have however many you had before, and you wouldn't get reimbursed for the for the more hives that you have now. If that makes sense. And that's all I have for old business. Does anybody else have anything I should mention? All right. Then we're going to jump right into the new business part of the meeting. With the treasurer's report, Amy. So easy. Woo woo. Yeah. So you can see um, up here on our um, on our <laughs> income sheet, we've done some expenses for the beginner beekeeping class, and some um, door prizes, and some supplies, and some batteries, and our new fancy little clicker. And so our total ending balance is $9,744.47. Um, I've looked at two trailers in the last month, and um, one looked great until I stepped on I about fell through. I'm like, oh, sturdy bottom. <laughs> so we passed on that one, and then um, somebody, Kimmy sent me another one, but it looked too good to be true. And by the time I called the guy, he said he had like seven offers, and it went in an hour. So it probably wasn't, you know, priced it right, we missed it. So keep it, uh, anybody, has, sees a pool long trailer, you know, double doors in the back. Let us know because we'd like to, you know, get that to haul um, all our supplies around to the different conferences and events that we do and community events. I think that'd be a good use of our money. So let me know if that's something um, anybody sees or has an in or a no, or that would be great. Um, we bought a uh, cordless vaporizer at the conference down in Tennessee this year, and we'll put a video up on how to use that. Um, as soon as the weather gets a little conducive to using it. So we'll show you how to do that so you guys can, if anybody needs to borrow that. So that will bring us to three of them, right, Al and Charlie, three the club has. We have a wand, a plug-in vaporizer, and a, another cordless one, right? Yeah. yeah, the one wasn't doing too hot from what uh, from my from it was too hot was the problem. Well, yeah, it was doing too hot, actually. Um, so I think that's why we ended up getting the new one. Um, but regardless, we do have a nice vaporizer available if anybody is doing oxalic acid treatments. And we also tend to put together a treatment team for that time of the year. So we'll work um, with you guys when the time comes to make sure that everybody gets treated that wants to be. Yep, it's not that hard, but it's important. Um, okay. Yes? What size of trailer are you using? Either a five by eight or five by 10. Probably five by 10. Under $9,000. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And we have been very fortunate as well. Let me say the, um, this is, 
Or extension office. The extension yeah. office. Or is it the Blonde County Center? It is the extension office? extension office. Okay, the extension office. The extension office has been gracious uh, enough to offer us a small bit of space here that we can house some of our uh, monthly meeting uh, materials. So that has been a blessing for sure. Uh, we actually just got that, that space here more recently. If you haven't noticed, there have been a lot of changes. Um, this is all new and this is not our equipment. This is also courtesy of the extension services. Um, they have been fantastic enough to allow us um, with our, um, our, our free meeting space that they provide us here so that we can do this every month for free. They also are allowing us use of all this wonderful equipment. So we're so thankful that they're allowing us to do that. Um, and part of that is, uh, uh, just our, our, our good relationship with them. We try to make sure that we clean up every night after we leave, and you guys have always been great about doing that, so I appreciate that as well. Sorry, sidebar. That's okay. Any other questions about our finances? Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Amy. All right, Deb is not here for the state report this evening. They have not had a state meeting, however, um, so the state report will be similar to last month's state report in that um, they're excited about the conference that's coming up. Um, obviously, there's no more registrations available. Your newsletter just came out, I think, last week. So uh, if you are a state member, please check your emails for that newsletter. If you are a state member and are not getting emails, or if you are a newer state member um, here with the club and you would like access to that information, please let us know before you leave today because we can definitely help make sure that you're on the list. All right, Paul and Sub is not here. We ordered Paul and Sub um, as, as a group order for the club. Um, at the last meeting we talked about a little bit, there was a lot of interest, so we went ahead and ordered that um, through Man Lake. It is on some sort of back order. We're not exactly sure why it isn't here yet. They didn't give us a good reason, but it was ordered probably three weeks ago. Um, so should be here anytime. Once it does arrive, um, we'll coordinate probably via email. So keep an eye on your email. Um, uh, a pollen sub order so that you guys can get some pollen sub out. Okay, so if anybody is in current need, get with Deb here before you leave and she can help you out. Well, maybe not. She might not be able to help you here, but she'll be able to help you out. All right. Pro Speed Order. That's something else that we're working on is a spring Pro Speed Order. Um, Still nailing down a date on that. It should be happening here in the near future. And same as the pollen sub order, we'll be sending out via email and uh, some information about that when the time comes. We'll also be putting a blast on social media. So make sure that you're paying attention to all that stuff. We'll definitely try to make it at least a day or two in advance. Um, uh, same with the pricing as last year. We're going to try to get it as close to cost as possible. So we'll let you know once we pick everything up what that cost is going to be. All right, something else that we're going to be ordering, um, treatment order. So I'm going to actually stop here for a second because I'd like to kind of open the floor to talk about treatments for just a second um, to see what treatments we should be ordering as a club. Last year, um, we ended up ordering um, Formic Pro. We did a, a large group order of Formic Pro, and we were almost too late on ordering it. We, we waited a little bit later in the season than, than I'm talking about it now, and the uh, um, demand got really high. So we were lucky to get it, but we were trying to get an order for Mightaway Quick Strips as well, and we couldn't get those. Um, so I'd like to bring this up here for just a minute to see if anybody within the club is interested in um, being a part of a group treatment order and what treatments we would be considering uh, purchasing. Me and Dan went to Worcester Saturday, and there was a woman there. Um, she's been all over the world working with bees. She was talking about grow mites, and she was telling us that uh, a lot of this um, amtrax, which everybody's using now, apicar, mm -hmm. um, the bees are starting to get really um, resistant. Resistant to it. Yep. Uh, so they definitely want you to do that. Uh, start changing up the medications and quit using it as much. Try something else. Mm -hmm. And they also are recommending now that you check your bees once a month through the summer for mites. That way you don't get a, a, a huge infestation all at one time. Right. So they say if you take just a small sample, and usually you take 300 bees, and if you get three mites, then you have to treat. Mm -hmm. 
you could take a hundred bees and get one mite, and you would be killing as many bees, but you would know what your mite level is. Right. And absolutely test again after your treatment to make sure that your treatment worked. That has been a big problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. People don't check, and then if the treatment doesn't work, then they end up with bees dead before Christmas, and that's mite. Yep, that's exactly right. Just wanted to put that out there. That's what they're recommending in the menu. Oh, yeah, there was a, a lot of talk about Kumafos and Chuck Knight. Um, is it Kubinate? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that stuff hasn't been used in, well, I've been in this 14 years and they weren't using it then. So, but they're still finding it in people's wax. So, it really stays in there. And they were talking about how it affects your queens. Hmm. And so, Amitraz is one of those things that's sticking in the wax. Also. Okay. And the queens are not as fertile because of it. That's interesting. That's good yes. to know. Um, I, get, I, I don't know if you guys are going to, as a club, buy the uh, videos from Time Life, but Bob Benny did an excellent presentation on interactions between different treatments. Um, and they went and tested wax all over the United States, even people that don't treat. And those people that don't treat, guess what? Their wax is contaminated. And there are, there's certain treatments that when the bees bring these in, it has an exponential effect on that wax. But he had just a fantastic talk on Bob Betty, B-I-N-N-I-E. You know, a lot of that too, and I'm wondering about that, Susan, is people buy free wax foundation, and that stuff is coming from China, no, this was stuff that well, is U.S. I'm just saying a lot of people buy from different places, and you don't know what's in the wax that they're using to free wax that stuff, right? So it can come from anywhere. They're pesticides and treatment residues. We have to talk about treat for yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I said, food falls, food and and. Uh, yeah, and Susan, to your to your just what you mentioned, we did actually pick up those for the club, and um, we'll be having a movie movie night for the club here a little bit later in the year, where we're gonna um, uh, utilize some of those videos just so we can we'll have popcorn and, and you know do the whole thing, but we'll get to watch some of those presentations from Hive Life because I uh, wanted to get them for us just because I heard how how uh, good they were. Okay. And I don't have any on salad. So does the club have any? Sure. So generally we um, we tend to, to try to provide as much of the oxalic as we can. It tends to be relatively cost effective for us to be able to buy a bag of it and then the, the club to just utilize it. Yes. Um, and we have the, the vaporizers and things as well. Uh, unless you've got like 40 hives, then you might want to pick up a bag of oxalic. But for, for, for just a few hives, I'm sure we can help you out. Um, but for the Formic Pro, that um, that is one that that's actually what we treated with personally last year. Is that um, something that a lot of people are considering treating with that we should consider making a large order for? Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else considering any other treatments that we should consider getting a larger order for? Um, one of the other ones that was mentioned last year was Mightaway Quick, Quick Strips. Does anybody want me to try to put in an order for that? Is that the same as? It is not. It only no. lasts a year. What is it? It only lasts one year. Morning grows two years. Yeah, the shelf life on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it depends on the specific treatment. So there are a few thymol based treatments that you can use. Um, it depends on which one you're you're specifically looking at. Um, I have not treated. I'm trying to think of one of the thymol based ones. Oh, Ap Apivar is a thymol. thymol based. Okay. Apigard. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it sounds like an echo up here. Okay, Apigard. Sorry. Um, so that is one of the thymol based ones. 
Um, is that something you would be interested in personally? It's hard to hard to find that timing. Oh, okay. Does it does any of our more experienced beekeepers have any suggestions um, for treatments that are a little less um, temperature sensitive than um, Formic Pro that we might suggest? Uh, temperature sensitivity and mite treatments. Um, she said that she struggles with Formic Pro because it's uh, so temperature dependent. You have to get it on the certain days. Well, the, the big thing about the mite liquid strips and the Formic Pro is you get the most release of the chemical in the first three to four days. So if you can make sure that you know you pick a time where maybe you're going to have lower temperatures for a few days as your first three or four days of treating, then if it gets hot, it, it's not a big deal. So, and I personally don't put my pad on top of my box. I put a slatted rack in my boxes on top of my frames, and I'll lay the pad up there. It gives me about a half an inch or an inch. It doesn't sit on the brood. I've not ever had any brood die from getting too close to contact. So just what do you use to put them on top? It's called slatted rack, and it's just a piece of it's like a box, but it's only this tall, and it's got slats in it. And they used to put them on the bottom of the box, and it helped with air flow. You put it on your bottom board, and we first had that conception. Yeah, it wasn't sure. Yeah, um, we made ours, which you can find mainly so. It's called slatted rack. So what I'm what I'm kind of gathering is that we definitely want to get some Formic Pro. We're not sure about other treatments um, as far as as group orders. You're talking about all of these, they're going right over my head with beginner. Sure, as, as they would, right? Because you had your you just had your class, right? So a little, some of this is going to be a little bit over your head. Um, if you remember, um, we did mention that uh, Varroa mite treatment is something that you're going to be doing quite a bit of, and. Um, uh, oxalic acid was something that we talked about doing in the winter time. So right now we're specifically talking about the summertime treatments. Um, so and about all these treatments, and uh, I'm sure I will need them, but yeah, well, you'll you'll need one of them, right? And so, and then that's kind of why we're we're um, discussing some of these now. Um, we'll actually have a treatment workshop prior to um, treatment season, um, so that we can get some hands-on uh, practice with some of these things. But as, as far as, as um, members ordering them, a lot of uh, you know a lot of folks with a few hives already are going to want to get get uh, jump on that bandwagon now, which is why we're trying to go ahead. And, we won't be ordering for a few months now. I just want to go ahead and get the feelers out there so that I know what I'm going to be ordering um, because I don't want to be caught off guard and not be able to get it. Basically, Mike, Linda had a good suggestion. Yes. Right here. Oh, I was just thinking if to look at. Guidelines. This would be a great time to go to that Varroa Mite, Maybe Health Coalition Varroa Mite treatment site. Because this, all of the treatment treatments, and has all the temperature guidelines. You can just compare. Yeah, I can. I can pull that up. Give me just a second. That's a pretty cool. <laughs> so, and, and you'll find that the Honeybee Health Coalition site was listed on those uh, beginner cheat sheets that we gave you. Um, and I'm going to actually go there here real quick. So for those of you that haven't seen this before, 
This is the Honey Bee Health Coalition's Varroa Management Guide, a very comprehensive tool for figuring out how you want to manage your varroa. So I'm just going to kind of skip all this stuff here at the beginning, try to find the meat and papers here somewhere. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. So we'll start with. Uh, I'm going to set up. <coughs> Bring this over here. All right. We're going to start with synthetic chemicals. So you're talking about Apivar. Um, it's treated for 42 to 56 days. Then you remove the strips. Um, restrictions not recommended for use more than two times a year. Um, do not use when colonies have honey supers on them. Uh, advantage is that it's safe and highly effective unless there's mite resistance, unless the cluster moves away from contact with the strips. This is actually what we were just talking about that people are asking that are, a lot of folks are saying that um, has become overused and um, bees are developing a resistance to it. So that's, um, that's apple bar here. So then apple stand, um, active ingredient, I can't say that. Um, apple stand is not one that, that I have much experience with, nor have I seen anybody use. Has anybody here used apple stand? I used to use it for years. Okay, so it was, it was more common back in the day. Okay, 15, 20 years ago, not that far back in the day. The state ag department gave us free stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so that's probably why they don't use this one anymore. Um, so check my... Mite resistance. Mm -hmm. Mite resistance, organophosphate, contamination of hive components. That's another one that we don't see used much anymore. Apigard, Apigard slash thymobar, which is a thymol based treatment. Um, this is one of the ones that we were mentioning before. It's a, um, I believe it comes as a gel. Okay, so it comes in a fancy piece container and you pop the top off. So then there's at the life bar. Which, yeah, I, I, this is not one that I'm very familiar with as well. Um, menthol in it. Mm -hmm. So this is Max or My Way Quick Strips. This is a very common treatment that a lot of people really enjoy using. Um, there's a couple different treatment options, which makes it easier for folks' schedules. Um, it is a type of formic acid treatment, so it's organic. Um, yes, there is temperature limitations. Yes. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Well, I'm reading this right off their website. Absolutely. Formic Pro. So that's what that's the, uh, the one that we were talking about. That generally a lot of us use. Um, same active ingredient, formic acid, as um, my way quick strips, just a different application of it. Um, it. It's actually a relatively easy application, it's just the temperature issue that, that a lot of people find um, troubling with this. Um, oxalic acid, oxalic acid, 
Um, that's a, a more uh, seasonal based treatment. So that's not going to be one that uh, generally folks are going to be doing in the summertime. Or you can do the dribble. Yeah, there, there's an oxalic acid dribble that, that folks do. Too. Um, does that mention that here? A heated one? Yeah. I've not seen that. Yeah, but he's saying he's saying like a, like as a liquid, just um, yeah, like a beat like a fog and not like a vapor. Al, you got a bee fogger? Yeah. Oh. How's it how's it work? It works. Uh but I tell you what, you can probably buy the uh, the bugs thing uh, from Lowe's or whatever. It works just as good. Okay. Uh, hop guard three. Um, that's made out of hops, um, hops beta acids. So it's an organic acid. Um, this one is messy, from what I'm told. So I've I've not actually done this. I've heard people have had success, but I've heard that it's messy. Um, also difficult to get a hold of. This is another one that last year folks were struggling to get. Um, so if you are interested in this, this would be one I'm looking, looking into early. It would be the hop card. Um, Non-chemical controls, then there's a screen bottom board, the sanitation, drone board removal. Um, Julia Rangel. Uh -huh. I think it was her said the screen bottom board drops from like down by 15%, which was a figure I've never heard of. That's interesting. So he, well, I don't know if anyone didn't hear that, but um, who was the speaker? Julia Rangel from the University of Texas AM. Okay, so for, uh, University of Texas AM um, had a presentation where she said that uh, the uh, screen bottom boards uh, can drop your mites by, what do you say, 13%? 15%. That's interesting. Um, I'm kind of just moving quickly through these because we're really not talking about uh, non-chemical methods. We're, we're trying to decide on uh, what chemical treatment we're going to buy as a club here. So did that help anybody? Was that useful information to anyone? <laughs> I put a poll on the Facebook group. The poll was, you know, who wants to do like you did last year? Sure. Yeah, I'll absolutely put, put a poll up on Facebook. Uh, not as many members are on Facebook as they were uh, in previous times, so I'm trying to meet folks in other places. Um, so if you do have something that you want that isn't Formic Pro, let us know. We'll try to work with you to make sure that we get whatever you need. Now I'll go back to this. Honeybee sales. I mentioned this a couple times already. There are order forms over there. We have three different apiaries that we're working with. Um, we'll make sure that we organize pick up, pickups um, here locally for everyone. If you have any questions on any of that, please get with me after the meeting. Um, but sign up sheets are over there and available for you. These are queens too. Just queens by themselves? No, we are not. Um, and the reason we are not is because we don't have anyone local that we've been able to work with that has queens in that number to be able to provide. I know other clubs do do queen orders, um, but that's just not something that we've done yet. Is that something that we'd be interested in doing? Just a queen order? Amy Kaiser. Okay. Amy Kaiser. Now, did they, they already put in an order, did they not? I don't think they put the Okay. What they do is reserve so many and then we sell them on and we don't sell that to the Okay. Okay. I know the orders have to be in. How many are they? You can just order with me on your own and go get it. You can. They are Minnesota Hygienics. Minnesota. Is that Minnesota? Yeah. What are they? All right. So if you guys have interest in getting queens, get with me, and if I have enough people who are interested, I'll get with Amy and we'll try to put a group order together for them.
them. If not, I'll just put you in contact with Amy, and we'll see what we can get to help that with. All right. The next thing on my agenda is a member-led workshop. Next month in April, we're going to be having a member-led workshop. I've had uh, quite a few members who are um, incredibly talented and have brought a lot of different things that they'd like to show you. Um, and so I figured a good way to do that would be um, to just make a workshop day out of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite anybody who would be interested in showcasing um, one of their own talents or something that they do um, that they think would be helpful to other B Club members. Um, get with me sometime between now and next month. Yeah, and dance is fine too. I mean, as long as you know the steps well enough to teach them. Um, uh, <laughs> Dan's going to teach the Lego dance next month. Uh, but uh, yeah, we would love to have you guys um, work with some of our members here to um, teach new skills. We can all, all utilize each other's knowledge to, to better our own knowledge base, and that's what we want to do here. So if you are interested, please get with me tonight or um, with Linda back there in the corner. She's our, our monthly content coordinator, so she helps a lot with this stuff as well. Um, get with one of the two of us, and we'll get you on the roster to help with that. All right. Now, now that I'm asking for things, I'm just going to keep asking for things. Volunteers. Uh, we need volunteers for a few events that we have coming up here in the next month. Um, so before the end of March, we have these two events. Uh, one is the Honey of the Hills West Virginia Beekeepers Association Spring Conference. Um, we uh, will have a table there where we will have raffle baskets, um, and we're allowing members who have um, beekeeping-related wares to sell, be that um, you know, beekeeping merchandise like uh, uh, like night lights and, and shirts or honey or um, woodenware. Uh, I know Al sells woodenware and things like that. We invite you guys to, to sell at our table. Um, we ask that uh, you be available to help manage that as well. Um, if you're going to be selling stuff, we would like that uh, you are there to be able to manage it. Um, Kimmy Heinerman, who is not here this evening, is actually going to be running point on our booth for the day. Um, so I'll get anyone who is planning on being a part of that in touch with her so that you all can coordinate. Um, we will be there that day, but um, I personally and my little crew here are going to be volunteering heavily with the Mountaineer Beekeepers Association. So we will probably be running around like chickens with a head cut off all day. Um, I will likely not get to see too much of our booth, um, so I want to make sure that we have enough folks there to cover it uh, for that day. Um, something else that we're looking for volunteers tiers for is the spring pollinator uh, triangle cleanup. That's going to be here at the end of March, and this is the second month in a row that I did not put the date on there. Um, I literally copied and pasted that from last month and didn't fix it. Um, it is the 26th, and it is at 9 o'clock a.m. in Westover. Um, basically, we're all getting together to um, clean up the pollinator triangle, similar to how we did last year, add some pollinator flowers. Um, it's been a, a great project for the community. They've wanted to get really involved. I think there's going to probably be 20 or 25 community members there on top of our club members and everything else. Um, as, as you all know, at this point, West Dover was just designated to be City USA, and we're using this um, pollinator triangle cleanup as a part of that um, designation because we are going to be partnering with West Dover for this foreseeable future to do projects like this within the community um, to help grow the, the pollinator habitats there. Um, so if anybody is interested in volunteering, please, we would love to have you. Looking forward. Conference on March 17th and 18th, and then the pollinator triangle cleanup is March 26th. Um, the meeting is not on March 26th. <laughs> the meeting is the first Tuesday in April. That date is wrong. Um, and I hope it is not wrong on your newsletters. It shouldn't be. Okay, um, but whatever that first Tuesday in April is, that's when the meeting is. Um, that's a bad copy and paste job too. You can tell us copy and pasting a lot this week. <laughs> Ten new events we have coming up. Uh, the Spring Pro Speed Order is coming up. Westover B City USA Day. That's going to be sometime in July. Shauna's running point on that. Shauna Cross. She's our um, the head of our month, our um, community outreach committee. And if you are interested in being involved with uh, B City USA Day, it's going to be a massive event. Um, she would love help with that as well. Um, 
Another thing that we are going to be working on this year as a club, something that we haven't done before, is the Honey, Har uh, the Honey Harvest Festival here at the Montgomery County Fair. Um, the Mon County Fair is the first week of August. Last week of July, first week of August. It's like the, it falls like in the middle there. Um, and we will be uh, working with um, hopefully a, a commercial beekeeper to get um, frames of honey that we can bring in here. Actually, we're going to be utilizing this space because the Mon County Fair is actually happens here. Um, and uh, we're going to get the kitchen, which is really nice because <laughs> um, uh, I told them we were going to be messy. But basically, we're going to be teaching members of the community what it's like to harvest honey and kind of uh, a little bit more about what it is to be a member of the Mon County Beekeepers Association, which is really, really exciting for us. We were granted um, from the West Virginia Beekeepers Association to have this event. So it's been a little over a year that we haven't been able to do it yet. So we're very excited to be able to finally put this event on and uh, any and all involvement we can get for that would be super helpful as well. Um, even if it's just ideas, um, this is, like I said, this is the first time for us doing anything like this. So and anything you guys can bring to the table, we'd be happy to have. Of course. Are you affiliating that with the FFA of the high school? So, I know my we are going, yes, but no. So not directly, but the FFA is going to be beside us. Okay. So like, um, they're going to have their, their like cow and pig show like right here somewhere. I think probably outside, probably not in here. Hopefully not in here. <laughs> I hope it's out there, but they said we could have this corner, so. Granddaughter approached Charlie about uh, doing something with bees mm -hmm. in the FFA. She was very excited. The teacher was very excited about that. That would be but awesome. I, I didn't know if that was separate from what you're saying. It, it would be separate, absolutely. Okay. Um, and and if you want, if you know, if you need any help with putting together that for them, let me know because we'd be happy to help you. Um, yeah, of course. That's all exciting stuff. Um, anything that you guys do, also, we have we have lots of materials. We buy um, like educational materials from Honey.com. We create our own educational materials. We have books available. We have um, two different beginner, or actually, one's not even a beginner hive. We have one um, beginner hive set up that has all of the different frames in it that tells all of the different like the life cycle of a bee and. Uh, how honey's made and uh, all of that. It's specifically geared towards beginner education. We also have um, a hive that we just got that has frames specifically for brood maladies and abnormalities, which is a little more advanced, um, but also very exciting educational material for us as well. So if you guys are ever interested in any of that stuff, please get with us because we're happy to help you educate the public. And that's all I got. Anybody have anything else? Let's win some prizes. I got three door prizes for the evening. Somebody's not growing their flowers fast enough or I'd have more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, first we'll do a door prize. All right. Wait, what do we got? What, what's the first door prize? The first door prize is going to be the book of um, the honeybee and the malady Ooh. that Mike just spoke of. The honeybee malady field guide just came out from the Pennsylvania Extension Service. A really good, great resource if you haven't had the opportunity to check it out yet. And the winner, 445 449. Is me? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. What a winner. All right, the next one is for making mead. Ooh, this one was mine. Four, four, five, four, three, five. Four, three, five. Woo, there we go. All in the back. Yes, and the last one's gonna be the t-shirt. You wanna open it up and hold it up so everyone can be super jealous of whoever wins. Homegrown honey. The winner of the homegrown honey shirt, 445-422. Nobody? 
Probably <laughs> it's her other ticket. <laughs> All right, well, going once. Going twice. Well, then let's roll. Let's let's roll it again. Alright. I'm oh, too late. Because we didn't want that shirt. <laughs> four, four, five, four, three, one. Oh, there we go, Mark Priscilla. Alright. And then $36. Yeah. 50, 50, 36 bucks. That's it. Can we do the honors? This one better be me. Is the green one green for money? This is the one you paid for. It. Yes. Nine three one nine five four. Who won? Oh, there we go! Woo That's right. Congratulations and thanks for playing the split the honey pot. I changed it up. Did you see that? My brother thought of that. Uh, like, he was like, you should call him with the honeypot. I was like, I've never heard of that before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. It was really a pleasure having you all here this month, and we'll see you again next month. Um, don't forget to sign up for stuff. Take snacks home with you. Take recipe sheets.